From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. First, the headlines. Pandemic pushing half a billion people into extreme poverty. Amazon under fire after inexcusable warehouse collapse kills at least six. Nigeria to ban airlines from UK, Canada, and Saudi Arabia. Zahra Billu under attack by Zionists. Civilian deaths mounted as secret U.S. unit pounds ISIS. Afghan families go back to making carpets as economy unravels. Our top story tonight. The COVID-19 pandemic is pushing more than half a billion people into extreme poverty, according to the World Health Organization, or WHO, and World Bank. It's the worst economic disaster since the 1930s, the agency said on Sunday. Their findings are contained in two reports published on Universal Health Coverage Day. They illustrate the disastrous impact of COVID-19 on people's capacity to get and pay for health care. The pandemic is likely to halt two decades of global progress towards universal health coverage. It could trigger, trigger declining immunizations and increased tuberculosis, as well as malaria deaths, the WHO said. It also said new evidence reveals that more than half a billion people might have to pay for health services out of their own pockets. Amazon is being accused of putting corporate profits over worker safety after six of its workers died. This was after a tornado caused the partial collapse of a St. Louis area warehouse last week. Stuart Applebaum, president of Retail, Wholesale and Department Store Union, said requiring employees to work through a major tornado event was inexcusable. Applebaum's remarks came after 30 tornadoes ripped through six states this weekend, leaving more than 100 people dead, including the six Amazon workers. Nigeria announced Sunday it is banning the entry of passenger planes from the UK, Canada and Saudi Arabia starting Tuesday. Those three countries have imposed travel restrictions on Nigeria due to the Omicron variant of COVID-19. Aviation Minister Hadi Sirika said these countries lack a moral right to operate commercial airlines to Nigeria. The country has seen more than 200,000 virus-related cases and over 2,000 deaths. The Omicron variant has also been detected in six people. Thousands of people gathered in Buenos Aires to protest the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. The government of Argentina President Alberto Fernandez is seeking a new loan. This would enable it to pay off the country's $44 billion debt owed to the IMF. Thousands of Indian farmers packed up their belongings and dismantled tent cities on the outskirts of Delhi on Saturday. They're headed home after a year-long protest against the government's agricultural policies. Prime Minister Narendra Modi was forced through protests to push through Parliament the repeal of three contentious laws. Farmers claimed these would let private companies control the country's agricultural sector. Hundreds of farmers danced and celebrated the victory early Saturday. They began removing roadblocks and dismantling thousands of makeshift homes along major highways. Tens of thousands had been camped out since November of 2020 to protest the laws. Farmers in India have political clout due to their sheer numbers. Four Afghan brothers hauled their family's carpet loom out of storage with the hope of earning a living as the nation's economy teeters on the edge of ruin. The Hydri brothers now spend their days weaving Afghanistan's famed complex rugs like previous generations of their family have done. Ulam Sahi, the family's 70-year-old patriarch, said that there was no other option for survival. Until the Taliban's return to power in mid-August, the Hydri brothers were running a successful business supplying flowers for weddings. But with the Taliban now forbidding lavish brothels loved by Afghans, the family's flower business collapsed. The brothers then decided to go back to the family's rug-making trade. 
Zahra Billu, who leads the San Francisco chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, is being accused of anti-Semitism by some Jewish organizations. Speaking at last month's American Muslims for Palestine conference, Billu criticized extreme right-wing forces, the Anti-Defamation League, Jewish federations, Hillel, and Zionist synagogues. Bilou described a well-funded campaign to bolster Islamophobia around the world. She also spoke of an interconnected network of Zionist-supporting organizations working to harm Muslims. Bilou works with Jewish groups who advocate for justice and human rights for Palestinians. ADL National Director Jonathan Greenblatt issued a rebuke of Bilou on Twitter. A Muslim teacher in Canadian province of Quebec was removed from her position over her headscarf, citing a controversial provincial law. Fatime Anvari, a third grade teacher at Chelsea Elementary School in the city of Chelsea, was offered a permanent position after working as a substitute teacher for several months, CBC reports. She started working full-time in the fall. After only a month, the school's principal reportedly told Anvari she had to be removed to a position outside the classroom because of her headscarf. Anvari told CBC she was shocked at the time. Quebec's Bill 21 bans most civil servants, including nurses, teachers, and police officers, from wearing religious symbols such as turbans, headscarves, crosses, and kippahs while on the job. Colorado's first Muslim state lawmaker says Congresswoman Lauren Boebert should face consequences for her recent Islamophobic comments about Muslims. Iman Jode, an Aurora Democrat and spokeswoman for the Colorado Muslim Society, said Boebert's commentary gives unspoken permission to continue hate. Joda said such hate speech has made Muslims in her area scared of Boebert supporters and her community is worried about their safety. Joda also said she hasn't seen or heard of any acts of discrimination or hate towards Colorado Muslims since Boebert's comments against Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Boebert called Omar a member of the Jihad Squad and suggested she could be a terrorist in a video revealed earlier this month. Jode called on Democratic leaders to censure or publicly reprimand Boebert and take away her committee assignments. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she had not determined whether to hold a vote on a resolution to remove Boebert from the National Resources and Budget Committees. Stella Morris, the fiancé of Julian Assange, called for his freedom Saturday, revealing the WikiLeaks founder suffered a mini-stroke in October. Morris tweeted that Assange suffered a stroke on the first day of the High Court appeal hearing on October 27th. One human rights expert said that the UK is literally torturing Assange to death. Assange has been incarcerated at a maximum security prison in London since 2019. The US government is seeking to extradite and prosecute him under the Espionage Act for publishing classified information that exposed American war crimes. Muslim groups have called Saudi Arabia's decision to ban the India-based Islamic movement Tablighi Jamaat unjust and said the law violates the principles of Islam. Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Islamic Affairs called on preachers to use next Friday's sermons to warn against the group's misguidance, deviation, and danger. Many Muslim groups have also said Saudi Arabia's tweet was directed at the North African religious group Al-Ahbab, which also performs similar activities. The Bliri Jamaat was founded in India in 1926. It is perhaps the largest Muslim evangelical group primarily focused on Muslims. A shadowy U.S. military unit sidestepped safeguards and repeatedly killed civilians, according to multiple current and former U.S. military and intelligence officials. The top-secret American strike cell launched tens of thousands of bombs and missiles against Daesh in Syria. The unit called Talon Anvil worked around the clock between 2014 and 2019, pinpointing targets. 
These included convoys, car bombs, command centers, and squads of enemy fighters. People who worked with the strike cells say it circumvented rules imposed to protect non-combatants. They said that the unit killed people who had no role into the conflict, such as farmers, children, and families fleeing fighting, as well as villagers sheltering in buildings. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. I am what hunger looks like in America. I am an eight-year-old girl who's not excited for the last day of school. Because this may be the last time I'll have lunch. Till September. I am a single father of two who works three part-time jobs. And that's still not enough to put food on the table. I was created by artificial intelligence from faces of the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. Feeding America, 200 food banks strong. They took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. Senators Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and Bernie Sanders have introduced a joint resolution disapproving of the proposed arms sale to Saudi Arabia, pointing to its role in Yemen's civil war. Representative Ilhan Omar has also introduced her own joint resolution aimed at blocking the sale of weapons to the country. Today we have with us um, Hassan Tayeb. Thank you so much for being here, Hassan. Thank you so much for having me on. Hassan al Tayeb is the Legislative Director for Middle East Policy for the Friends Committee on National Legislation. He's amongst the signatories to a recent letter uh, written to Congress that Congress must block Biden administration's wrongful $650 million arms sale to Saudi Arabia or risk fueling further U.S. complicity in rights violations and Yemeni civilian suffering. I wanted to talk about this letter. Can you tell me how it was put together and uh, who is it aimed at? Are you aiming at predominantly the Republicans or the Democrats? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me on the air to, to discuss the vote that happened last week on Senator Rand Paul's joint resolution of disapproval uh, Friends Committee on National Legislation did sign on to this letter effort. It was uh, spearheaded by uh, Amnesty International, Democracy uh, for the Arab World Now or Dawn, and Just Foreign Policy. Uh, it brought together a really diverse coalition uh, of organizations representing tens of millions of Americans. And we were really proud to support because this Saudi sale, this weapon sale by the Biden administration sends a real message of impunity. It's $650 million of air to air munitions 
that relinquishes what we feel is key leverage at a moment when the U.S. should be using existing leverage, uh, including ongoing U.S. military participation in the Saudi-led war and blockade in Yemen, uh, these, this particular weapon sale, but also billions more that are in the pipeline, to compel Saudi to lift its blockade on Yemen. And uh, this blockade is devastating the country and a key driver in the humanitarian crisis. Uh, we've now got 16 million people on the edge of famine. We've got millions of children suffering from hunger and acute malnutrition. We've got the world's worst case uh, cases of cholera, uh, the biggest cholera epidemic on the planet. And the blocking of fuel through Hadeda port, uh, which is a lifeline for millions of Yemenis, is a key factor that's driving this, as well as the closure of Sana Airport. So these senators and these advocacy groups uh, last week were trying to send a message that this is not the time to be selling weapons to Saudi Arabia if they continue to force their blockade on Yemen. Unfortunately, that vote was not successful in getting a you know, majority of Democrats and Republicans to be on the record to do this. Uh, the, the tally was 30 to 67. But... I will note that this was a significant vote that brought together a bipartisan coalition with the members you named, but also a majority of Democrats to oppose a Democratic administration. So I think this shows that we have momentum to continue this work to end all U.S. complicity and try to get Saudi Arabia to lift its blockade on Yemen for the sake of millions of Yemenis being plunged into famine. And isn't this going back um, on Biden's word that when he was running for office and later when he was uh, sworn in, he had said that he would stop Saudi impunity, that he would not let them get away with what they were getting away with. So can you uh, speak to the backtracking? Absolutely. So unfortunately, U.S. complicity has been going on in the Saudi-led war in Yemen uh, for nearly seven years. It started under Obama. Uh, it kept going under Trump, and it, it's continued under the Biden administration, despite a lot of promises while he was on the campaign trail to end that participation. And we'll see there were some critical policy resets that I'd like to mention. Uh, they lifted a foreign terror designation on the Houthis. Some people think that was controversial, but to me, I think that was a critical step that would have uh, you know, allowed uh, humanitarian assistance to be delivered to all parts of Yemen uh, and make sure that, you know, we don't cut off Yemenis uh, from humanitarian aid. So that was critical. They restored humanitarian assistance and USAID funding to northern Yemen. Uh, you know, so that was another critical step. They announced an end to offensive operations. But unfortunately, the devil's really in the details there. And you know, how they defined offensive operations and defensive operations wasn't really clear. Um, you know, we saw that uh, spare parts and maintenance for Saudi warplanes was ongoing. We saw that intelligence sharing was continuing. Uh, and it wasn't ever really known to us whether or not the administration considered the blockade an offensive operation. We definitely consider an, op an offensive operation here at the Friends Committee on National Legislation and are trying to make sure that there is accountability for this crime that is the ongoing blockade, which we think is a main driver of the crisis and, uh, you know, dare I say, a prerequisite to peace in Yemen. I want to go back a little bit, and you spoke about the several administrations' role in the Yemen crisis in Yemen. Now, what is next? Like, how do we hold uh, the administration accountable? How does, how, with so many coalition partners, um, what pressure, like, Aside from this letter, what can the average American do that doesn't want to be a part of um, this ravishing of Yemen? What can they do? Great question. So one critical thing is that they need to get educated about what's happening and ongoing U.S. complicity. I think watching your show and staying tuned in is really important. Um, you know, but the next thing I think has to do with Congress. And we have a critical opportunity. We've tried a lot of different things. We have 100, of mem 100 members of Congress now that have spoken out in the past year under the Biden, Biden administration 
uh, spoken out against the Saudi blockade. That was step. That was a really important step. We saw this vote on a joint resolution and disapproval to block these weapon sales. Another critical step. Didn't pass, didn't get over the finish line, but sent a really important message that a majority of Democrats, including uh, Majority Leader Senate uh, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, voted against the sale. We also saw on the House side that uh, Rep. Rokana led an amendment to the National Offense Authorization Act to call, cut off U.S. military participation, including spare parts, maintenance, logistical support, and intelligence sharing. That actually passed with 219 votes, uh, and it got 11 Republicans to come on board. So that was critical. It didn't get into the final bill. It did get stripped out, but it shows that there's a bipartisan majority that wants to end this conflict. So what do we do now? I think now it's critical that Congress reassert its war authority and introduce and pass another Yemen war powers resolution. Now, this is a very important piece of legislation. It was actually um, you know, already passed in 2018 and 2019. Uh, and in 2019, Trump vetoed that resolution. But now I think the po politics are a little bit different, a lot different, I should say. And I think it's going to be a lot harder for the Biden administration to continue U.S. complicity and veto a resolution of that nature if it gets a majority of Democrats on board. So that's our goal right now for 2022. One, education. Two, pass a Yemen war powers resolution to finally terminate this ongoing U.S. participation in the world's worst humanitarian crisis on the planet. Aside from getting in touch with their Congress people, uh, and educating. Can you tell us um, some more concrete actions that the average person can do? That's one of my questions. The next question I have before uh, we move on to that is what, um, what are the blockades? Who, who are the people who are working against um, what you're trying to achieve, uh, ending this, our complicity in this war? Can you, uh, because this is an educational forum, we want people to know who are, who are the folks of lobbying against these resolutions um, and working to make sure that we keep pumping Saudi Arabia with arms? Two great questions. I'll start with the first one um, and then just about, you know, finish with the last one here. So your listeners, I think they should be empowered to know that they can reach out to their member of Congress and ask that they introduce a Yemen war powers resolution to terminate this ongoing support. You know, bring a coalition of your, your friends, your, your family, your allies, uh, you know, if they're uh, with, uh, you know, faith organization, bring your, you know, bring your supporters and, and meet with your member of Congress, go to their town halls, ask them hard questions about U.S. complicity, maybe research and, and know whether or not in the past they supported it. I'll just say that every single Democrat in the Senate uh, in 2019 voted to end U.S. participation and participation's ongoing. Did they flip-flop on that position and or have they just not been given the opportunity uh, to vote on a new Yemen war powers resolution, and they should be asked that by their constituents. Uh, folks can also uh, write a letter to the editor, write an op-ed, try to build a coalition of supporters. I mean, there's a lot of folks that have come out of the woodwork to oppose uh, U.S. support for this war, led by uh, you know tens of thousands of you know Yemeni Americans, peace activists, faith groups, uh, Muslim, Christian, Jews. Uh, you know, atheists, agnostics, so many people have come out against this particular uh, war and U.S. support for the war. But we need to grow our coalition and make sure more people are aware. And, uh, you know, I definitely encourage people to continue to learn and try to educate more and more folks. As far as who still supports this devastating war and blockade, I think that's a bit of a complicated question. Uh, a lot of folks would say that they oppose the war, um, but they oppose, you know, the humanitarian suffering. They want to see that end, but they don't really have what I think is the right solution to get us from point A to point B. Uh, what's critical is U.S. complicity in the war. There's a lot of different factors going on. I mean, you have the Ansar Allah, aka the Houthis, which are you know now in control of 80% of Yemen's population. You have the Southern Transitional Council backed by the United Arab Emirates, uh, and you have the Hadi government backed by the Saudis. 
Um, they're, you know, supposedly a coalition, but sometimes the, uh, the Saudis uh, and the Hadi government and the UAE and the STC have actually used U.S. made weapons to attack each other. So what can we do in such a complicated situation? Well, number one, we have to recognize our side of the street, which is U.S. support for the Saudis. Um, now, that doesn't absolve the Houthis of what they've done. They've committed atrocities, human rights violations, and they should be held to account. But the U.S. has very limited leverage on that piece of the puzzle. Uh, so one, we have to terminate our participation in complicity. Um, and the other thing is we have to compel Saudi Arabia to lift its blockade on Yemen. And, and that should be decoupled from all of these ongoing negotiations. The people of Yemen should not be held hostage. And I've said this to many lawmakers and staffers and people in the administration that one thing Yemenis agree on is the need to open up Sana Airport. They don't care if you're, uh, you know, who's, uh, you know, in Houthi governed territory, STC, if they're in Aden or if they're in Marib. They all want to see that airport open. So that's a really good place to start. Uh, as, so one, I think we have to, you know, show our numbers, show our strength, and let folks know that the way through. Uh, this crisis is to not continue ongoing U.S. complicity. There are lawmakers that disagree. They say the Houthis are now the problem. Saudi has, uh, you know, Saudi and the Hadi government, they've actually made a lot of concessions. I don't see it. I don't see the evidence for that. They've offered a ceasefire deal, but it really wasn't done in good faith. It didn't really have a, a realistic pathway to peace. And we, sh our demand should be really clear that we should not be selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. We need to use U.S. leverage to compel Saudi Arabia to end its blockade. And we need to get Congress to act to terminate all ongoing U.S. participation in this war before more Yemenis starve to death as a result of, of the blockade. Thank you so much, uh, Hassan Atayeb from the Friends um, Legislative um, Policy for Middle East. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is such an important discussion. I would just encourage people to stay in the loop. Uh, you know, you can contact us here at the Friends Committee on National Legislation by going to fcnl.org. Uh, you know, I, we want to hear from you. We want to get you to participate in this advocacy because your voice really does matter. And I've seen over the past several years since I've been working on this particular conflict that uh, we went from no U.S. support for, you know, uh, no congressional support for ending this complicity to now getting a majority of people in the Congress that want to end support for the war. So it shows that activism uh, really matters and that, you know, we can make a difference if we work together. Thank you so much. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.